early childhood early childhood victimization um, will lead to negative health outcomes. Um, we know that kind of intuitively, and there's a lot of data that goes behind that intuitive knowledge. So the adverse uh, childhood experiences is a study that happened a long time ago, and many people have replicated or are continuing to use the model to assess childhood impact on later health disparities. So it started out as a long running study that um, is backed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And um, again, called Adverse Childhood Experiences or ACEs. And the study began in the 1990s. And again, it's been replicated in, you know, by thousands and thousands of respondents and different ways looking at slightly different populations. The original study looked at 10 different types of adverse childhood uh, events. So things like physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, uh, parental or household issues like mental illness, if someone in the house was incarcerated, um, if there was substance use or divorce, or at the time of the survey in, in the early 90s, people asked about if the mother was treated violently in the home. We now know, of course, that anybody can be treated violently, and that's going to affect somebody's health and, and their outcomes in life. So when researchers looked at this data and how many people had experienced some of those negative childhood experiences, um, they noticed that there were some correlations. So some of the correlations included things like people were less active physically, um, they smoked more, they used alcohol or drugs more, they missed more work when they experienced those negative or adverse childhood experiences. Um, they had diabetes, they were um, over an ideal weight, they experienced depression or suicidal thoughts or attempts. They had higher levels of sexually transmitted infections. They also had things like higher rates of heart disease and cancer and stroke and COPD and broken bones, things that we don't typically associate with these bad things happen in childhood. We don't typically associate them with higher risks of stroke or broken bones, but there is a correlation. So the relationship that they found was that the more ACEs people had, the higher their health risks were. So pretty equal climb, no matter what kind of health risk we were looking at. So an example, really simple example is, um, if somebody had zero ACEs, so zero out of those 10, um, they were pretty much commonly like expected to use alcohol in a, you know, an abusive or substance use kind of way. So a couple of percent. When people had four or more ACEs, that rate skyrockets to around 16%. So that's just one example of, of how things ramp up. So what they ended up finding was that kids who have adverse childhood experiences need to spend time and energy focusing on those survival-based needs. So whatever those things are, they spent more and more time working on just those basic core needs that were taken away from them. So those social, emotional, and cognitive impairments led to things like social um, problems, social challenges. So children might withdraw, they might not be good at making friends, they might fail at school, um, fail meaning like, you know, in, in the traditional sense of, of not doing well academically, and they might experience other kinds of life challenges. And those challenges then would lead to an adoption of health-related risk behaviors, um, and that would lead then to disease and disability and other social problems as adults. And what it ultimately means for many folks is that those health disparities, those diseases, ended up with an earlier death for folks that had more ACEs. So there's a couple of studies that have been done specifically with LGB and T populations. So on the slide right now, um, you can see that there's some general population numbers of like how many people had one ACE. So the general population is like 58%. And then when we look at LGB people, so lesbian, gay, and bi people, that rate jumps up by 20 more points. And then if we look at trans folks, it's 91% who've experienced one ACE. And we can look at the same data for those who have four or more ACEs. So you can see there's a really dramatic difference between the general population and trans folks and LGB folks. 
So um, Kaiser and the CDC who ran this study, um, the, the main author of the, the primary report, um, Vincent Folletti, wrote that the adverse childhood experiences are the main determinant of the health and social well-being of the nation. I want to note too that trans participants reported um, emotional abuse, physical neglect, and emotional neglect more frequently than compared to cisgender LGB people. So there's some differences in how trans people experience ACEs versus lesbian, gay, and bi counterparts. So let's take a look next at um, some lifelong health disparities and, and kind of what happens when we play this, this out. So for, for trans folks, um, trans folks do experience higher rates of many things like we've already kind of gone over. So sexual assault, intimate partner violence, hate motivated crimes, especially when trans folks might be um, immigrants, folks of color, um, people who are young, like teens, people that are older. Um, so those hate crimes tend to mix and match and increase when there's other intersections. Um, we know that trans folks also are experiencing more things like depression and anxiety and suicidality. And trans folks are also experiencing more substance use. We can look at some other data. So I'm going to share with you a lot of data. We're going to move away from data as we move, um, move on today. So another piece of data is that um, trans kids are three times more likely to experience sexual assault in the last 12 months versus non-trans kids. When we look at things like how safe do trans kids feel at school, um, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey that I mentioned before, who's now asking about gender identity and sexual orientation, they found that 3.6 times more, sorry, <laughs> trans youth were 3.6 times more likely to feel unsafe in school than their non-trans peers. And they were five times more likely to be threatened or injured with a weapon at school. Um, it's kind of amazing to me that weapons are still getting into schools, but um, that number is pretty, pretty startling. We'll talk a little bit more about adult suicide later, but when we look at kids and suicide, um, so these are folks that are under 18, 35% um, of trans youth have attempted suicide versus 7% of non-trans youth, so substantially higher. 44% um, have seriously considered suicide versus 16% of non-trans youth. So again, just kind of offering some comparative data to help us kind of ground what's happening with youth who are trans. So what we're going to do next is we're going to look at ACE data, ACEs data. So some of those things about like smoking and substance use, sexually transmitted infections. And we're going to look at what the rates are for trans folks compared to what the rates are that we know of for non-trans folks. So there's not going to be a perfect one-to-one um, -one relationship with some of these, but we're going to start with smoking, which does have one of those one-to-one -one relationships. So the uh, Kaiser ACEs study found that um, when folks uh, had four or five ACEs, they were at about 16% um, rate of using um, cigarettes or tobacco products. When we look at trans folks, trans folks are at rates of 30 to 45%, so double or triple the rate of the general public. When we look at things like alcohol or drug use, we also do have comparative data. Those of us on this call know that many survivors, both trans survivors and non-trans survivors, use substances to cope with their past or their current abuse. So alcohol and drugs can be a really good coping tool, might not be good for the long run, but it may help with some of those um, symptoms of trauma to make life more bearable. So when we look at the general population, again, from the ACEs survey, we could see that four ACEs brought people up to around 14 or 15 percent that used alcohol in ways that were probably considered abusive, um, you know, not so healthy for them. We can look at the trans rates of alcohol use, and again, we're looking at two or three times higher, so 26 to 47 percent of folks that are trans and use alcohol. So it makes sense, right? If there's more trauma, it's more likely that people are going to experience and use things like alcohol, drugs, or cigarettes. Let's look at missed work, and this is where we don't have an equal comparison of data. So we don't, I'm not going to show you the ACEs thing right now, but I'm going to show you, this is, this slide is, is complicated and we don't need to go over all the details of it, but there's a lot of things that contribute to trans folks 
not going to work or making specific choices at work. So some people said that they had to hide their gender identity or they didn't ask their employer to use their correct pronouns or they hid the fact that they had already um, transitioned. Lots of things can happen that trans folks might be doing in order to stay employed. And that might mean denying their identity or not being their full self at work. For those who did miss work, we can look at um, a couple of things that may contribute to that. So widespread employment discrimination is one of those things that may affect trans folks and employment. Um, we don't currently have federal protection for trans folks with an employment discrimination. Cities might, states might, federally we don't. There can be anti-trans or anti-LGBT harassment that's in the workplace that doesn't get addressed by superiors or, or by other coworkers. There can be minority stress, and we'll talk about minority stress a little bit later. There can be alcohol and drug use by the trans folks that are employed, and that alcohol and drug use might mean that they oversleep or they're hungover and they don't make it to work on time. We also know that trans folks oftentimes ends up, end up in lower paying jobs, low wage jobs. And sometimes those low wage jobs are also really harsh work environments. They may not have paid sick time. And so again, that may lead to people missing work because they've gotten sick, because they were trying to work too hard um, or their environment was just too difficult. So this is where some of the cycle we can see starts to happen. So the impact of the challenges at work or school, things like dropping out of school happens, right? When there is harshness that happens at school, when there's abuse and bullying and some of those things. And that can lead to poor you know, school performance. If somebody's dropped out, they're not gonna even have any performance, but it can also lead to work performance that's um, less than great. People might isolate because of what's going on. They might feel more anxiety or depression, either because of those things or as a result of those things. They might have some economic or other disparities. Um, so like no housing or um, experiencing employment discrimination on the job or trying to get a job. They might have more street-based violence getting to and from work. Lots of those things may contribute to people having challenges at work. So you will see a lot of photos as we go through today. Um, I always love to have photos, especially ones that are kind of snarky and fun like this, because I think um, we live in a world where sometimes we only see images of trans people that are depressed or suicidal or not in a resilient state. So most of the photos that you're gonna see today are of people who are trans, at least one trans person in the picture, um, oftentimes at least one survivor in a picture in one of these pictures, and, um, and you'll see their resilience, hopefully. So let's look at physical activity and severe obesity. Again, we don't have good comparative data here, but we can look at things that contribute to trans folks likely um, having higher weight and, um, sorry, higher weight and less physical activity. Um, hopefully my memory is gonna work as well as my voice today. So when we have things like depression and anxiety, a lot of times people become inactive or they overeat. They sit on the couch and watch TV instead of going and running errands or going for a walk. A lot of times trans folks um, intentionally isolate. So don't wanna go out in public because they get um, you know, harassed on the street. So it's easier to stay home and safer to stay home. When folks are low income, it can affect what kinds of food they can buy. So people may end up um, at heavier weights because the things that they can access are not fresh fruits and vegetables, are not lean proteins, um, but they can access white bread and pasta and some of the things that will make people in general a little bit on the heavier side. Let's look next at depression and suicide attempts. So again, we can compare this pretty directly with ACEs data. So you can see the curve of the ACEs data, general population goes from very low with no ACEs to substantially high with seven ACEs. So general population with seven ACEs, about 35% will have had a suicide attempt in their life. When we look at trans folks, that rate starts at about 40% and goes upwards to 76%, and in some studies, even higher than that. 
So that's one of those profound things of like how many trans people have attempted suicide? 40 to 76% is a lot, a lot. So I wanted to break out that 40 to 76%. So the 40 comes from looking at all respondents from the National Transgender uh, Discrimination Survey. So one of those large surveys again. When we add in factors like sexual assault, that raises that number from 40% of suicide attempt up to 64, 65%. When we add abuse that happens by teachers, so sexual assault by teachers or physical assault by teachers, those numbers go up into the 70s. So again, this, this lets us know that what happens in childhood really affects what happens in adulthood. So there can be lots of reasons why there are higher rates of depression and suicide. Um, trans people inherently aren't born to be more depressed or suicidal. Um, so some of the factors are those increased levels of abuse. Um, the lower access to mental health services, so may not have insurance, may not have enough um, liquid income to pay cash for mental health services, widespread dis discrimination, lots of those things that we've, we've already mentioned are going to be contributing factors. Um, I always include um, an image on the slide of, of, of this to share at least somebody in my realm who has um, ended their life by suicide. And this is a group of Forge fellows um, from probably like six or seven years ago, maybe even longer than that. And the person third from the right, Karis Ross, um, ended her life by suicide um, quite a few years ago. So she is missed. And um, I am guessing that most of you um, have known somebody within the trans community that has also ended their life by suicide. So let's look at STIs next, or sexually transmitted diseases next. Um, this is a non-equal comparison. So the ACE study, original ACE study, looked at sexually risky behavior. So what I'm going to share with you is not sexually risky behavior, but it's the best data that we can kind of have to, to look at things. So they looked at sexual risk. I'm going to share with you things like um, the rate of sex work. So that's not sexual risk, but it does place people in a higher sexual risk category. So um, generally about 1% of the population, general population, engages in sex work or sex for money or sex for basic needs. When we look at trans communities, that rate is 19%, so basically 20 times higher than the general population. We can also look at the rates of HIV. So this is not about, again, risky behavior, but this is about um, you know, sexually transmitted infections or infection of HIV through other methods. Um, general population is around a half a percent who are infected with HIV. When we look at trans women, the rates are around, seven, or sorry, 42%, um, which is really high. And it's much, much higher for African-American trans women than any other race of trans women. Trans men are also higher than the general population, coming in around 3%. Studies range from 2% to 4% for trans men. Um, no data for non-binary people that has been reported. So we can look at a lot of reasons why people may have higher HIV rates. So um, they might not be uh, believing that they can protect themselves. Um, they, they might be unlovable. They might feel unlovable. So I can't ask for protection. There might be a lack of sex education. And if, um, if you're watching the news right now, you're seeing places across the country say, we don't wanna talk about sex education in a certain way. We don't wanna talk about things other than heterosexual um, relationship dynamics. So that's gonna to lead to folks not knowing how to protect themselves. Sometimes people have sexual assault histories and feel that they've been educated in that way, like sexual assault was their sex education and may not understand that they can do things that are consensual, which includes protection. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to add is that, that trans bodies sometimes don't fit typical forms of barriers. So if somebody's not using PrEP um, or some kind of uh, prophylactic measure for STI or HIV, particular con control, um, their bodies may not fit into normal condoms or normal dental dams or other ways to protect themselves. 
Um, I'm going to play a video, and unfortunately, it is not captioned. It's from the direct source. And this is a story from Jada and talking about HIV. Michael, you're muted. Thank you, Shelley. Um, can people see the same screen again? Same big screen? Yes, okay. Let's try the video again. Sorry about that. In shock, I was scared. Getting into care has been a really wild experience from when I first found out I had HIV up until now, you know, I've been back and forth with treatment, but recently it's been the longest stretch. It's been almost 10 years now since I've been on treatment and I've transitioned within the last five. I continue to see this fabulous doctor because she works with me. If I say that there's this or that that needs to be addressed, she focuses and she gives me the attention that I need. She talks about different things with me without stigma, without judging. And I think that's very important. I'm very open. I've learned a lot. Even through transitioning with my medical provider, she's been ultra sensitive and very helpful in this transition. Something that motivated me to stay in care was when um, after a couple of years, my T cells were over 900 and my viral load has been undetectable. It made me feel empowered. Something that I would tell a trans girl who is hesitant to start treatment is don't wait until your body has disintegrated. Don't wait until your immune system is so fragile that someone can sing and break it. Don't do it. It's so hard to recover. I would tell a trans girl, a trans girl who's coming into herself, finding out she had HIV, darling, it gets nothing but better. If you can look and use me as an example, use me as your support, we can accomplish this. Living well means living, not waiting for, oh, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that in my life. I have made it a point to live. I'm gonna rock it out and I'm gonna live it to the max. That's what living well means to me. HIV treatment works. Get in care, stay in care, live well. Fun video. Um, I'm gonna swear, she's a kick-ass person in real life too, so um, fun, to, fun to see her on video. All right, so let's look at um, the kind of the collection of these other things, these other health disparities. We're going to kind of clump them together because we don't have good comparative data. Like the slide says, we don't have a lot of trans-Pacific data. Um, but what we do know is that a lot of trans folks are fearful of accessing health care. And, um, you know, many don't want to go to the doctor, don't want to go to a nurse practitioner um, out of fear of being disrespected or mistreated. So at least 20%, probably much higher than that. And there's a lot of really good reason why many trans folks are fearful of healthcare and healthcare providers and healthcare systems. So when we look at people that actually do get in the door, um, you know, a quarter of them up to almost a half experience negative things when they go to their doctor. Um, it's not gonna encourage folks to go back when they experience negative things when they go. It could be negative about their transness, could be negative about a lot of different things that make up who they are. 
so we just went through a lot of data, right? It's kind of a lot. Um, I love this picture. It's kind of like, oh my God, boom. Um, so I encourage us, if you want to stretch, if you want to take a sip, if you want to raise your arms above your head, if you want to breathe, that was a lot of data. We're going to move into another little bit of data, hopefully, maybe not so intense, but maybe it is. Have we all had a breath? I hope you're all breathing, so. All right, let's look at some trans-specific data. So when we look at trans folks and ACEs, um, people have not really researched trans folks very specifically around ACEs. So what I'm gonna share with you next are eight things that Forge has, um, I don't wanna say made up, but we've looked at the experiences and the patterns that we've seen that's in the research that indicates other things that are happening with trans youth that might and do impact their health as an adult. So let's start with a little bit of a brainstorm. I've talked at you for 40 minutes, which is a really long time. So um, let's use the chat and um, think about, based on what you've just heard or what's in your head, um, what are some things that might be trans-specific that are ACEs? So I see somebody's written exclusion, isolation. What else? Yeah. Rejection, bullying by peers or institutions, neglect, rejection from family, mm -hmm. misgendering, yeah. Judgment, excellent, yeah. Um, bullying um, from self-expression, invalidation of identity. Mm -hmm. yep. Lack of representation, self-hatred. Mm -hmm. Fewer protective or resilience factors, yes, exactly, yep. Um, being kicked out at a younger age, exactly, yeah. What are some other things that youth might be experiencing? So fear of being outed um, or being threatened, yep. Religious trauma, um, lack of parental support, family rejection. Mm -hmm. uh, community rejection, lack of resources, uh, provided bathrooms, uh, corrective abuse, um, intersections of racism and gender identity. Yep, perfect. Invalidating. Um, yeah, um, I'm having problems reading the chat, but I think that's what it says. Um, excellent, those are those are right on, right? Um, there were no wrong answers here, but these are really great. So yay, um, you're gonna see some of those things um, because y'all are smart. You're gonna see some of those things that we're gonna talk about um, as we go through this. So someone mentioned bullying, right on. So um, bullying is one of those trans-specific ACEs. We can look at bullying that happens in school, at home, in neighborhoods, on the streets, whether it's in your neighborhood or not in your neighborhood, in extracurricular activities, basically bullying can happen anywhere. But for youth, it often happens in those kinds of places. I'm gonna share with you probably more on this um, ACE than the other ones, um, because I think the bullying goes in lots of different ways. So um, kids can be bullied through a lot of different ways. Some of them are kind of structural or um, uh, like top down. So when we look at some data again, and again, the data, the numbers aren't so important, but what is happening is important. So 60% have of trans youth have been forced to use a bathroom or locker room that doesn't match their gender identity or presentation. 50% um, are called by an incorrect name. 28% uh, are not allowed to wear the clothes that they prefer. Um, so, you know, those are some ways that our, our kids are getting bullied by not being able to access the things that their other peers are able to access. Um, we know that there can be a lot of negative consequences when people are bullied and not allowed to use the correct bathroom. Um, you know, we can look at a lot of that data and we can realize that people have negative health impacts like, um, you know, kidney disease and urinary tract infections because kids will try to, to not go to the bathroom because they can't use the bathroom of their, um, of their um, that aligns with their identity. So the effects of bullying can happen in, in some other ways too. So like, you know, 44 to 60% felt unsafe at school. And I think it's probably higher than that, but this is data that's coming out of um, journals, which are, I think, always a little underrepresented. So it can really negatively affect kids' self-esteem, their relationship with their friends or their family, um, their schoolwork. So they can end up um, not doing as well academically. 
um, it can affect their school attendance. Um, you know, and kids say, I don't like it, I can't go to school, I don't feel well. Well, it might be because they're worried about being bullied. And obviously those things can lead to increases in depression and suicidality. Again, when we look at bullying and um, what happens at school in terms of dis um, discipline issues, 20% of trans youth um, who reported bullying or abuse were actually blamed for that abuse that happened. So backwards, right? Um, three times of the trans youth um, or were, sorry, three times, um, people were three times more likely to experience harsh disciplinary treatment at school. So um, trans kids act out, um, non-trans kids act out, the trans kids get more harsh disciplinary treatment. Shelly, can you let me rest my voice for a second? Sure, Mike. Oh, thanks. Um, I've encountered verbal harassment in the bathroom and people peeping into the stalls saying, look, it's a girl, and other similar incidents that made me feel unsafe. Thank you. So each of these aces, so we've started out bullying is the ace. Um, we just heard a quote and then I'm gonna offer something about resilience. And we're gonna talk more about resilience um, at the end of this section. So one of the things that we can do around bullying and trying to kind of counteract that or, or build resilience around um, the after effects of bullying is to build social networks. And that can be with engaging teachers to, um, to do better, to be good with their trans kids. Um, this particular picture was taken in a smallish town um, and it was around the time where some of the rollbacks, the federal rollbacks were happening that made it much more difficult for trans kids, um, 2017, something like that. Um, and all of the kids' uh, teachers came to a rally that the 17-year-old kid organized. So the signs on these the, that these teachers have up is, you know, cis teachers supporting trans youth. So teachers can make a difference. So the second trans-specific ace is around denial of identity. So I heard that in the chat as well. So this is really when adults are not letting kids be their true self. Um, it can come out in a lots of different ways. Um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of them because I think that people can kind of understand what that means. Um, what happens sometimes is that there's a denial or a minimizing of what kids are going through. So like, you know, that's the, oh, it's a phase or he'll grow out of it, or, you know, she's just confused. So that's what happens a lot of times as a way for a denial of identity. Sometimes kids are encouraged to not talk about something. Again, a way to deny their identity. Um, sometimes parents kind of say, oh, hey, let's not go to that family gathering because the parents might be embarrassed or they don't want other people to know what that kid's um, true identity is. We do know that even well-meaning parents um, end up kind of squelching the identity of their kids. Um, a lot of them wanna, want their kids to have a good life, and, and that's in big magic air quotes, because they can't imagine, the parents can't imagine being trans as having a good life. Um, that's totally not true, but again, you know, it comes out of that, that par parental love of their kid that says, I want my kid to not experience abuse or discrimination. So that's part of why it can happen that parents deny their kid's identity. But when, when kids feel that, when they experience that, they see that behavior. Even if the parent means it to be protective or good, the kid sees it as rejecting. And that then leads to a whole bunch of negative uh, consequences. Caitlin Ryan with the uh, Family Acceptance Project, she looks at LGBT people. So the data that she has is, is incorporating all of those letters of the alphabet. And we've talked about the data that's on the slide already, but just what rejection leads to are higher suicide attempts, higher levels of depression, um, more likely to use um, street-based drugs, more likely to have HIV or STIs. Shelly? When my daughter was little, I spent so much time fussing over how she looked. I should have been concerned about how she felt. We didn't know about transgender but I know how sad and depressed she got right before middle school. The school helped us find a counselor and that's when we found out how hopeless she felt. I wanted to make sure she wasn't rejected by others, but instead I was the one who was rejecting her. I'm so grateful I could change things before it was too late. 
So this is one example of, of that recognition and the ability to shift back from denying some someone's identity to recognizing um, the need to embrace um, her kid. Um, one of the things that can happen, somebody mentioned this in the chat too, about conversion therapy or trying to engage in corrective behaviors. We don't have a lot of data that, that's trans-specific. We have LGBT data. And again, numbers don't matter so much, but conversion therapy still exists. Um, and there's a, a large range of consequences that can happen from conversion therapy. Um, I'd like to play a video. Um, it is LGBT, but um, you'll see the trans pieces in here and, and kind of the impact that conversion therapy uh, can have on young people. And hopefully the sound will be up on this one. So reparative therapy, you might also know it as conversion therapy or ex-gay therapy or sexual orientation change efforts, is a series of these dangerous and completely discredited practices um, engaged in by mental health practitioners trying to change a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. It's absolutely devastating experience for a young person to go through and m most of the young people who are subjected to that suffer lifelong, really permanent damage. And they will subject these kids to these awful, awful treatments that in the past have ranged from electroshock therapy to nausea-inducing drugs that now are primarily talk therapy, but that still, even when you take the electroshock therapy out of it, they result in substance abuse, they result in depression and anxiety, and a lot of the times they result in suicide, and we have lost way too many of our survivors along the way because of it. That's why we are so grateful to have a chance to work with survivors like Ryan Kendall, who somehow managed to survive, not only survive that experience, but to turn his life around completely, going from being, you know, homeless, living on the streets, completely separated from his family with very bleak prospects for the future too. He was just so determined to not let that experience destroy his life and he was able to uh, go to school. He's going to law school now. We're so proud of him and he has worked with us to pass the first law ever in the entire country that bars therapists in California from trying to change a young person's sexual orientation or gender identity. We, he's now helped us to pass a similar law in New Jersey, and we are working on other state laws in an additional 20 states now. Thanks to Ryan and our partnership with him, we're really changing the country on this issue. It takes years, sometimes decades, sometimes a lifetime before people can actually come out and talk about this. Sam is somebody who is willing to get up in front of a room full of people and tell a story that I cannot imagine having to relive as often as Sam does with vulnerability and humor and genuine sweetness and willingness to connect to an audience that might not always know how to ask the right questions, that might sometimes make it worse. Sam is willing to put themselves on the line and honestly their own well-being on the line to make sure that these people know what happened, know what still happens, and are engaged and committed to making sure it doesn't happen again. Sam is also an MIT student in nuclear engineering technology. Sam has never let what happened years ago be the defining factor. Sam is a force. I cannot wait to just keep being a friend, keep being a colleague, and keep watching what happens to the world as Sam grows up in it. So one thing I like about this video, which is a little bit old, is um, Sam, person at the end with a mohawk, um, when the film was made, was a student at MIT. Um, he has uh, since graduated, um, and he, I think Sam uses he and they pronouns, and he's now part of the Biden administration um, as a nuclear physicist. So um, there can be some good things that happen even when things are hard at some points in life. So um, you can look up Sam at some point and figure out um, where he is today. But it's 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 a it's a story that ended up with a really happy um, happy ending. 
So some of the things that we can do um, around kind of that denial of identity is we can see people's wholeness. So we can see Sam's wholeness um, as not just somebody who's queer or trans, but somebody who's an, an MIT graduate with multiple degrees and, you know, all of those good things. But, we, you know, people don't have to graduate from MIT to still be able to be seen and valued for who they are. So um, like who's on the slide right now, um, we have permission to say this, but it's um, the second person from the left is our graphic designer's kid who um, came out four or five years ago and um, and has transitioned. And it's just like, you know, it's a small world, but she sees her kid and her kid has has really thrived from it. So number three is something else that you all have mentioned in when we did the brainstorm. So being expelled from home. And this kind of goes along with being expelled from school. So we can look at things like housing instability. When we look at um, trans youth versus LGB folks, um, you can see that LGB um, folks have a lower rate of housing instability than trans folks who are not quite double, but, but quite a bit higher. So again, you know, we talked about this before, there's a lot of things that are happening with employment or lots of other things that make it harder for trans folks to have a roof over their head. When we look at um, just kind of the rates over time, so the other one is kind of a one-time snapshot, we can look at the fact that one in five trans folks will experience homelessness at some point in their life. So not just in youth, but at some point in their adult or youth life. Shall we? I haven't had a warm place to sleep for three weeks. The only food I've had comes from grabbing the comes from the grabbing food from my tricks houses. Thanks, Shelly. So this is one of the reminder places of like, you know, if you're a victim service agency um, and you're serving trans folks, which if you're serving anybody, you should hopefully be serving trans folks too. Um, having snacks, having coupons to McDonald's or, you know, any place for somebody to get some food, um, which is kind of related to housing, right? I've, you know, people often who don't have housing don't have good access to food. Um, sometimes that can be a really good way to bond with a client, as well as make sure that that basic Maslow hierarchy, you know, need is met of getting, getting fed before receiving victim services. So one of the things that we can do in terms of building resilience is really mirroring or showing folks what healthy relationships look like. So kids that have been thrown out of their house may not know that other kids don't get treated poorly by their parents or by their other family members. So when we can show and share with those trans youth or those trans adults that healthy and vibrant families can happen, not in, not in sharing it in a way that will make kids feel bad, but just letting kids know that it's possible to have a healthy family relationship. Let's look at police misconduct as the fourth ace that's trans-specific. Um, we know that you know, what I shared with you before, that there's a lot of youth that are getting kicked out of their houses. They might be surviving um, through the street economy. Through, through sex work, through um, exchanging drugs for places to sleep or um, for food or for money. And so those kinds of things oftentimes lead young people and, and adults to having more contact with police. So if you're living on the street, you're likely gonna have more contact with police just because of where you're living. If you're making a living through the street economy, you're also gonna have more chances of you know, having interactions with the cops. And there's likely gonna be more chance of having a violent interaction with, with law enforcement. Um, I know that a lot of folks do value the use of, of what law enforcement can offer in protecting folks. Um, but I think when we look at minority populations, we've been seeing in our country the last you know, 10 years or more, probably a lot more than that, um, the levels of misconduct that's happening by law enforcement. So trans folks, um, like many other minorities, are, are experiencing a really harsh reality by law enforcement. They referred to me as a female at first, but after they checked my ID, they referred to me as a male. They treated me as a prostitute and told me to leave or else I'd be arrested. Thanks, Shelley. 
so a lot of trans folks talk about this as kind of like walking while trans um, and a lot of trans folks just walking down the street are perceived by law enforcement or others as engaging in sex work, even when they're just walking down the street. So this is one of those ways that people's bias and misperceptions are ending up causing a lot of harm for trans people who are just going about their daily business. So one of the things that we can do proactively is work towards justice, whether that's working towards police reform around race, working with immigration reform, working towards ending violence against um, you know, specific populations, um, including trans populations. There's a lot of ways that we can work towards justice so police misconduct doesn't happen um, so frequently or at all. The fifth uh, ACE that's trans specific, it's also specific to other um, identities, is about microaggressions. Shelley, are you able to read this one and then um, number six as well? Microaggressions are brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional. They communicate derogatory or negative slights and insults, or even some hostility toward a group of people. These words and actions establish, reflect, and reinforce the dominant paradigm, erasing the experiences and realities of a minority. So many of us are familiar with microaggressions um, and how they play out. Microaggressions can be about race, about disability, about transness, lots of different things. So here's a couple of examples of, of microaggressions that are trans-specific. So if somebody says, you know, wow, I would have never known you used to be a girl, that's a microaggression. Or somebody says, you are so beautiful for a trans girl, that's a microaggression, right? So it's bringing in transness as something that is unrelated to what they're saying. And they're kind of saying, you know, hey, I'm surprised that you were this way or putting some caveat on it that makes it feel really not so good. So one of the ways that we can um, kind of address the microaggressions and build resilience is by calling people in. So I'm a big, big proponent of inviting people to, you know, come in versus calling people out. Your style might be different, but, you know, if we hear somebody making, a, you know, a microaggressive statement or behavior, we can say, hey, that wasn't cool. And we can just draw them in and, and take them aside and say, you know, that that wasn't appropriate or that hurt somebody's feelings or, hey, dude, don't do that again. I mean, we can do that. What, what, however, we choose to, to share with people like that wasn't cool. So the sixth is a uh, minority stress. Shelly, are you willing again? Thank you. Minority stress is the result of observable incidents, vigilance for future incidents, and a person's decision that the incident is related to that person's minority status. As a result, they internalize this process as stress. Shelly. I've encountered verbal harassment in the bathroom and people peeping into the stall saying, look, it's a girl and other similar incidents that made me feel unsafe. Thank you, Shelley. Um, so one of the things that we can do to think about kind of restoring that or, or changing that resilience factor is creating access to support and healing. So we can't necessarily get rid of minority stress or microaggressions, but we can try to find ways to make space for healing and support. And that might be offering, you know, your front porch to the kids down the street to come and sit and have lemonade on, or it could be literally in our organizations creating healing spaces that actively welcome trans folks into the fold. Number seven for trans-specific ACEs is legislated discrimination. So I'm guessing that um, if you look at social media, if you look at the news, you will be seeing and, and hearing about trans-specific legislation. There's many things, there are many things that are going on right now, but the result of those things, so um, trans youth in sports, um, the don't say gay bills in Florida, lots of the things that are happening right now all of those things contribute to interrupting a learning experience for, for trans youth. 
kids will miss out on those key developmental skills. Like if they can't play soccer with their friends at school, they're going to miss out on like how to be part of a team and how to work together. Um, so it's not just that they don't get to play soccer, it's that they've missed out on a developmental skill that soccer brings with it. Um, it can also, the legislative discrimination can mean that the kid doesn't have a safe bathroom to use um, or any bathroom to use um, in some places. Um, it excludes people from groups, from activities, from being a normal peer with normal things. Um, I'm using normal in big quotes, of course, but like, you know, engaging in, in school life in a, in a way that feels good and equal. And it can mean that the kids are feeling afraid to be themselves anywhere because they're being denied access over and over and over again. So our political climate has changed over the last many years. We have, if we look at federally, um, and again, I'm not going to be partisan, but like, you know, the prior administration had a, a different legislative and political climate than our current one. Um, but that's from the federal level. We have state level, we have local level. And sometimes there's a lot of conservatism and sometimes it's a little bit more liberal, but there's a lot of fear that continues on. And part of that fear continues on because folks are worried that protections are going to get rolled back. Um, what's going to happen, you know, next week, next year, next month, whatever it is. Um, so the fears can be about being outed, which was mentioned in the chat before. Um, fears can be around things like immigration status. So again, that those intersections of not just being trans, but how do they intersect with other pieces of identity? There's a lot of concern around safety. Um, that can be about being outed, it can be about the lack of protections, um, but there's a lot of very, very real concerns around safety. Um, there's a lot of concerns about not being treated at all, not being, um, not being able to access services at all. And again, we can look at where those rollbacks are from the federal level all the way down to the state or the local or the municipal level or the school-based level. Um, fortunately, a lot of the federal level protections that were rolled back and made it worse for trans people have now been kind of rolled forward again. So there are protections back in place. But again, there's a lot of undermining that's happening at that local level or the statewide level. So some of you have seen things in the news like, um, you know, the Texas Attorney General um, says that transition care for minors is child abuse under the law. This has kind of been put on hold now, but this is what the messages were, right? That, that in Texas, if you had a trans kid and you were seeking trans-related medical care for that kid, the state could come after you as a parent for child abuse. That's stunning to most of us. Another example is, um, you know, in a different state, um, this was reported in time and it's happening everywhere, is that the people that are providing services are being faced with harassment or threats or even violence. So pediatricians who work with trans youth, just seeing them for their colds and flus and whatever else, but are working with trans youth are experiencing threats because of the work that they do. So, I mean, we can look at it similar to people that provide reproductive health care. So people that are providing care for trans youth, they're experiencing many of the same types of things. Shelly, can you read this one, please? Every day I wake up to my newsfeed flooded with another person killed by police, another new law that takes away an LGBT right, another slew of protests because Black Lives Matter, another set of memes with quotes that real people in government are mocking who I am. As a Black queer survivor of police violence, I don't know how much more I can take. So this was used with uh, permission um, from a colleague of mine on social media, and this was posted this year. Um, you know, when, when the political climate is maybe better than it was, um, but it's hard on all of us. I think we're all feeling the weight of some of that. But again, you know, when we look at these intersections, it makes it really, really hard for some folks that um, have these multiple identities um, and are trying to live in the world in the best way possible. 
So some of the things that we can do around resilience is to protect and work towards trans rights. And that can be a whole bunch of different things. We, we're going to talk about that in a few, few minutes about what we can do. Um, it doesn't mean going to rallies. It doesn't mean having to do um, things that you have to be out in front and, you know, being really vocal and political. Um, but there's a lot of things that you can do to work towards the rights of all people and trans people in particular. So the eighth and last trans-specific ACE is culture-wide discrimination. And this kind of includes a lot of what um, I've just shared with you. Um, on the slide right now is um, a picture that says white out, wipe out transphobia on a kid's hand. And on the other side is um, a drawing um, that relates to Leela Alcorn who ended her life by suicide. And um, in her suicide note, she wrote, fix society, please. And so, the culture-wide discrimination that she and so many trans folks are experiencing is, is really about, you know, just please, you know, fix society, make it better for me as a trans kid to live in this world and not have to have so many people be against me every single day. So it's a really, it's a, it's a tall order, but it's a really simple order. Like why can't kids be able to live fully in our world. So again, you know, her words, I think, really resonate for a lot of us about fixing society and what do we need to do to make that happen. So I wanted to, to overlay this, this next image, um, and it's something that I've talked about a lot when we've looked at the impact of COVID um, and what's going on in our world. So this kind of relates to both the last Trans-Pacific ACE around legislated political things and this one around um, you know, legislative discrimination, um, cultural discrimination. And we can look at some variables that are really affecting all of us right now, the, the COVID, the economic um, kind of depression-ish space, racism. We've had legislated hate. So, you know, these bills that are coming up that were, you know, are trying to make it harder on trans folks to, to be in the world. But we also have this level that overlays all of it that I'm calling like emboldened hate or sanctioned hate. So we see political leaders or celebrities or people, you know, in the media saying really horrendous things. And it makes other people feel that they are allowed to say those things too. So we see that a lot with race and racism. We see it a lot with trans folks as well. So just kind of like, I mean, I, I encourage people to look at what you're seeing if you're scrolling on Facebook, you know, what do you see that might be a microaggression, a macroaggression, somebody saying something really hateful? And how do we stop that? I mean, I don't know that we any of us have an answer for that, but how do we stop that pattern of sanctioned hate or emboldened hate when we see it so much all the way around us. News from a 15 year old boy I tutor. There's a kid in my religion class who I have no idea if they're a boy or a girl. So when I see them, I just call them fam at my plaintive look of, I don't know if I heard you right, you know, like family. The youth have spoken and fam is the gender neutral bro. I absolutely love this quote um, from a real parent, um, a real tutor that's doing stuff with, with kids. So, um, you know, a lot of times we look for words that are not gendered, you know, bro, which is typically gendered. Um, so this this particular kid, you know, calls everybody fam, and so does now the tutor that's the adult. So pretty darn cool. So one of the places of resilience that we can offer kind of those protective factors is to really embrace trans people, to be kind, um, to mirror language, to find ways of um, including people in ways that we may not have realized that we weren't including them before, using language and just all of the things that say, you are welcome in my space, you are welcome in my service, you're welcome in my house, whatever the place is, but to really embrace folks and let them know that they are okay. And I know that sounds simple and I, and I always do the kind of this wooey thing, but like to be kind is really a, a powerful way to combat some of these things that are really harsh. Um, I'm going to play you a video um, and it's going to shift our mood a little bit into a, 
into a hopefully more optimistic space. So this video is um, one that was made in Wisconsin by a trans filmmaker and actor. Um, and it's it was made around some of the legislation here in Wisconsin around trans youth and sports. So it's a lovely video and you may recognize a person or two in this video. I learned that practice pays off. I learned the value of hard work. I became a part of something bigger than myself. I wasn't great in school, but baseball and eventually softball motivated me to really work hard. I never played college ball. I never went pro. But through mushing, I got to be part of something. I learned how to win, and how to lose, and how to keep going either way. I grew stronger. I grew more confident. I met some of my best friends. I had fun. I treasured those memories. I hope all kids get the chance that I got. I hope every kid in Wisconsin can be part of the team. Trans inclusion is important to me. I coach kids in soccer that are gender fluid and non-binary. My kids are on their team, and those are just their teammates to them. Let kids play, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, deja niños que jueguen. Let kids play, Wisconsin. 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 I just want to play with my friends. Bye. You're muted, Michael. Thank you, sorry. Um, <laughs> I can sit and talk to a, a microphone that's muted all the time. Um, hopefully that was a positive video to shift us into a more proactive space of the things that we can do. So this was a film that was made out of something that was negative that was happening that was harming trans kids. And it was one way of how we can shift that narrative a little bit. So we are going to do something fun. Hopefully it will be fun. If you're at a computer or a tablet or have a web browser that you can open, now is a good time to do it. So I would like us to think about the trans aces that we just shared and talked about. And I'd like you to think about what you can do to build some protective factors against those aces. So um, I'm going to open up the slide, the screen too. You can open it up. There are eight different pages on it. And um, you can move over little boxes and type in what you think you could do or what the world can do about that specific ace. Does that make sense to folks? And if it doesn't, please share in the chat and um, we, will, um, we will figure it out together. And I'm gonna open up my browser as well and have it on the screen. Oops. If I can multitask. Okay. So are people kind of grokking it? You can just move one of those um, things over. So I'm seeing people doing that. Excellent. So move them over and there's, you can see on the left side, there are the eight trans-specific aces that we talked about. You can pick any one you want to start with. You don't have to answer all eight of them, but think about what are some of the protective factors? What are some of the things that you, your agency, your community can do that will make a positive impact about or around that trans-specific ace. And we're gonna take probably um, maybe about five minutes for y'all to drag those little squares or rectangles over and figure out what you can do.
just a reminder that spelling does not count, it's kind of like flip charts. So um, feel free to um, enter what you're thinking and, and not worry too much about spelling or form or any of those things. I encourage you to think outside the box too of some things that you can do that um, may not be what you learned about in um, as an advocate or as a provider. So it looks like many of you have, have moved from slide one down downward towards slides five and six, some of you down to eight. Feel free to, to move down and add your comments to the other slides or whatever they're called on the, on the left side. Somebody put a thumbs up. Oh my God, how did you do that? Fabu, thank you for doing that. It's great. <laughs> We're not gonna go over all of these uh, together. Um, I, I will send them out for for the Wix app people to, to send back out to you. I am curious on uh, police misconduct, what ACAB means. I'm gonna have to Google. I'm getting clues from, from my people. Thank you. Let's take about another minute or so um, for you just to look around, um, at, keep on adding if you'd like to add, but look at what other people have written on each of the eight slides um, to get some ideas that maybe you didn't have. Um, learn some new phrases like I just did.
I love seeing that the screens are are getting really full. So thank you for um, engaging and moving little boxes over and and thinking about what can be done about some of these things. Because um, we can talk forever about what's wrong, but if we don't talk about what's right, our world is not going to change. Thank you all for participating. I'm going to leave the leave it open if you want to keep on adding. That's totally good. Um, but I'm going to stop sharing my screen and going back go back to the other uh, PowerPoint. Thank you again for, for participating in that um, exercise. I know sometimes we go to trainings and, and hope that we don't have to do anything at all. And other times some people are like, I wanna do something, I don't wanna just sit and listen. So um, hopefully there's a mix of that um, between videos and, and getting to do stuff. So thank you. All right, so um, I used this picture one time before and I loved it because it has like these trans pride colors on it. Um, so way to go, everybody. Thank you for like adding all your, your boxes. Um, and we can we can look at the guy that's got all this, you know, stuff going on. All right, let's let's end with some some slide into disrupting the aces with some practical interventions. Um, this this photo was taken. Um, Shelley might know if it was a couple years ago. Well, it's got to be at least a couple years ago, at the Philly Trans Wellness Conference, which is this huge conference. I think they draw about fifteen thousand people to it. It's a free conference in Philadelphia, and they have a lot of kids that come to it. And I just I love. There's a whole sequence of these pictures with this kid throwing up this like rainbow colored I don't know poofy thing. It was really cute. So it's a good reminder to me and to all of us I think to look at where there's resilience among trans kids and their trans parents and their siblings um, and where fun can happen. Okay, so let's look at um, how you can help in some prevention strategies. Um, so these come from the CDC. Um, so they're not looking at trans specific things, but it's talking about in general, what can we do to uh, counteract ACEs? What can we do to make the world a bit better um, when folks have experienced adverse childhood um, experiences. So number one is um, that safety opposes neglect and violence. So when we can provide a place that's safe, whether that's in our home, in our office, um, you know, at the local coffee shop, wherever it is where we can create a space of safety, it counteracts, it opposes the neglect and violence that's happened. So it counteracts it. It gives a kind of a, it rewires our brain in a way when we can feel safe in some place. The second is that stability counters chaos and unpredictability. So all of us know that when youth or adults experience violence or trauma, it's a really chaotic um, feeling. Our, our world is turned upside down and um, we don't know which way is up or what's steady or what's not. So when we can create stability for folks, um, that stability could be, I will be here when I say I'm gonna be here or um, you can always call me or whatever that level of stability is that you as a professional or in your personal life can offer somebody that is really going to counteract what happened in their childhood. So the third is um, that nurturing opposes hostility and rejection. And again, you know, hostility and rejection are common feelings when people have experienced trauma in childhood. Um, all of us, you know, are aware of that, whether we have the words for that or not. And nurturing might not seem like something that providers or advocates or professionals do. There are lots of ways that we can be nurturing. So just to give you some ideas, we can have things like stuffed animals in our, our brick and mortar offices. We can have um, tea or hot water or hot chocolate, um, things that are, are typically seen as nurturing or loving or caring. It doesn't mean that we have to go and hug our clients or whatever, but it's it, it, we can create a nurturing environment for people to feel that level of safety and stability and nurturing. And it will counteract that um, that hostility and the rejection. I love this picture. I, 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 I say that I love all of the pictures because I really do, but this is just such an intimate nurturing photo, I think, of, you know, an adult, you know, very carefully um, trimming this kid's hair. And that can be nurturing. 
so sometimes people say like, you know, I'm just one person. Like what, what difference does that make? Like, you know, I can't change the world. What we know though, is that one supportive adult can significantly, like really significantly lower youth and adult suicidality for one thing, like by 40%. So just having an adult or one person in somebody's life that is supportive, that provides that safety, stability, or nurturing, or all three of them, dramatically improves that person's life. So we can connect with trans youth and trans adults in lots of different ways. Um, you know, victimization and rejection can really take a toll. So um, we can try to help build people up and we can build people up in lots of different ways. So I've given you a couple of ex examples. You all have created a lot of examples in that Google document that we just shared. Um, but you can do things like, you know, make trans folks feel that they matter to you. Um, that's especially important for youth, uh, more so than adults, I think. Um, you know, always use people's correct name and pronouns. And if you don't know what it is, ask, share your pronouns, get to know who somebody is and, and you know, use their name, use their pronouns. Um, expressing things like affection and kindness towards people is really, really important. And again, sometimes that's not in our professional role, but we can find ways of doing that, that stay within our own professional boundaries and still show kindness towards people. Um, we can talk about um, your expectations for them having a happy and successful future. So this is, again, is from Caitlin Ryan and the Family Acceptance Project, that when we talk about young people is like, oh, hey, when you go to college, you are going to love being in the dorms. I don't think people love being in the dorms, but like, you know, you can talk about their future as being happy and good. And it really makes a difference in, in allowing youth to imagine a happy and possible life. And of course, we can include trans youth in our activities, in the things that we do, um, and that's an obvious one. Um, I wanted to share this um, this card with you. It's it's a card that was given to a colleague of mine, and um, it says, "Dear neighbor, I wanted to give you a big thank you for hanging a pride flag, a trans pride flag, on your house." It truly gives me a sense of safety and pride in both the LGBTQIA plus community and my city's community. Happy Pride. So this was just an unsolicited note that came to uh, my friend and colleague in this medium-sized city. Um, and these are the people that own that house. And um, it's Helen Boyd, who's facing us, who's a, an author of many fabulous trans-related um, books and subjects. And the back of that person is Rachel Crowell, who is the person that made the video about the trans kids in sports. Um, so just to kind of make that human and what people can do and how people can engage. Um, so we can make our support visible and we can make it visible in lots of different ways. Um, and I'm not gonna go into all the ways, but you know, we can add things like rainbow or trans pride, you know, flags or stickers. We can have name tags that have our pronouns on them. All of those things that make our spaces more welcoming to trans youth and trans adults. And we know, um, I know because I know um, what WICSAP is doing and I know what some of the other organizations in, in Washington are doing and around the country, that a lot of you are already doing this work of making inclusive environments, supporting trans youth, supporting trans adults. And so it's just a matter of keeping on doing it and doing a little bit more um, if you can and when you can. Let me share a few resources. Um, many of these don't have the exact URL on them, but they're easy to find based on what's, what's on the bottom of the slide. So we started out talking about the Kaiser research and um, the ACEs studies um, originally started out in the 90s. So if you want to read more about um, the ACEs, the results, um, I really encourage you to do so. It's, it's very fascinating. And there are some LGBT specific breakouts that you can read about as well. Um, there is a growing body of research about trans resilience. So talking about not what's wrong with trans people, what, what barriers trans people experience, but really looking at how trans people are vibrant and um, can bounce back and how and what is happening around trans people to make life better. So I encourage you, these are just three examples look for some of those examples and check them out. Um, videos, books, articles, lots of things. 
I mentioned the family acceptance project a couple of times. Um, this is really progressive work that looks at how families, and I would take that to be even broader than families, any adult can really have a profound impact on young people who are trans or lesbian, gay, or bi. I encourage you to look at the reachingvictims.org website. Um, Forge was a, one of eight partners in this project, which is just a huge project funded by the Office, on, Office for Victims of Crime. And LGBT was one of those eight underserved populations that we built materials around. And so there's quite a few materials there on youth and trans youth and LGBT youth. So I encourage you to go check those out if you'd like more specific um, information um, in video form or in print form. Futures Without Violence um, created some fantastic palm cards. Um, we have a whole bunch of them that we can send you. You can get them directly from Futures. So this is one of those ways of having something in your office that you don't have to pay for or design or have some graphic designer make, but it talks about trans folks and creating healthy relationships. So again, it's just a resource that you can freely access and have in your space to offer to trans folks that you're working with. Um, I encourage folks to keep learning. And um, whenever I talk about learning, um, you may not need to know more about trans people. You may need to know more about race or disability or religion. Um, so I encourage you, whatever it is that you feel that you don't know as much as you'd like to know about, to go pursue that. We live in a world right now where information is pretty easy to access. So if you need to know more about trans stuff, come to Forge's website, go to somebody else's website that does trans education, but find that area that you need to learn more about and take some time, please, to um, explore and then put those things into action. So before we move into some questions or some comments time, I'd like it if folks would be willing to think about for a second and then enter into the chat um, some things that are micro-inclusion. So micro-inclusions are these um, things that make um, a move towards greater connection or acceptance or healing. So they're the opposite of microaggressions. So what can you do to uplift trans or non-binary individuals' strengths, survival strategies, or methods of thriving? Like what can you do today what could you do tomorrow? Can we use the chat for that? Y'all might be like burnt out because it's the end of the day and we already brainstormed. Thank you for adding people. So introduce uh, with pronouns. Normalize sharing pronouns and introductions, email signatures. Um, Okay, too fast for me. Um, eliminate silos between various human um, service organizations. Um, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read. Um, I actually uh, bought a coworker who is questioning transitioning a trans mask and she loved it. Yay, cool. Um, a healing library at work um, and adding more voices of different people, gender neutral restrooms, exactly. Pronouns, hanging up a flag, speaking up, sharing resources including stories of trans folks. Yep, perfect. Respect, yep. And those are what, what people are, are putting in the chat right now. Almost all of them are free, right? There are things that you can implement right now. You don't need your boss's permission to share your pronouns, for example, at least I don't think you do. Um, you don't need a lot of things that, that cost money to implement an environment that is better for trans folks. Excellent, keep it, keep it going in the chat. Um, so think about what you can do every day as well as thinking about how you can make some of those structural changes to work with your coworkers and multi-organizations and all of that to make a difference. Thank you for continuing to add in the chat. Um, I would like to open things up to questions if folks have questions um, or comments or if people wanna go home early, I totally get that too, because it is the end of the day. And I'm gonna stick up uh, my contact information just so you have it. Um, if you'd like to drop a note to me, if you wanna ask something or share something um, that's not happening here. Michael, we have a question that says, these are beautiful photos, may we use them with attribution to forge? 
Um, I'd like to say yes. I think it depends on what the which photos they are. Um, we have permission, so um, if somebody would like to use them, can you contact me and and ask before using them? And I know I just talked into the void. So um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm going to go with you. Yes, that that's a yes. It, it's a yes with a, a little bit of a but to it. So um, you know, I'm, I'm not sorry, I meant for like contacting you. It's a yes for contacting yes. you. Yes, contact. Um, yes, perfect. Thank you. And yeah, I agree. I think some of the photos are just just beautiful, brilliant, um, radiant. What other comments do folks have? I know we've talked about a lot of things today, um, a lot of things that may be new to some folks. Thank you, Shelley, for sticking my email in the chat. So I'm seeing, uh, can you tell us some of the books um, by the friend who hung up the, uh, the, the trans um, flag? Um, Shelly, can you help me with Helen Boyd's books? Um, because I'm blocking on their names right now. Um, if you Google search for Helen Boyd, so B-O-Y-D, you will come up with her books. Um, she's really prolific on Facebook as well. So not books, but um, offering really fantastic resources and stories um, on Facebook. And I don't think she's on Twitter. Um, Shelly, can you... Remind me of, thank you. Shelly just stuck it in the chat. Perfect, thank you. Um, so another question looks like, um, as an ally, um, or no, this is a comment. So as an ally, be mindful of not coming off as patronizing like you're a savior. Yes, definitely. What other comments or questions do folks have? You know, if people are looking for other books too, there's, I, I'm fascinated by the number of young adult books there are. And um, sometimes adults think, well, I shouldn't be reading those because they're, they're for kids. But there are some fantastic young adult books that have trans characters that are complex and really dynamic and really interesting. Um, Forge, for example, just read um, as a collective, we had a support group and we talked about the book Pet by the person's name that I can never remember how to say or spell, um, but it was a fantastic read. And, um, you know, it's a good thing for like people to have conversation. Yes, um, person just typed it in the chat, thank you. Um, but many books that we, we can have conversations about, whether it's with a support group that you're running, even if it's not like focused on sexual victimization, the book might be something that really gives young folks a way to see the world in a different way that loves them and cares about them. Bring that on. Other comments or questions? And I'm loving seeing all the, the questions in the, all the books listed so far in the chat. Excellent. Um, I may turn things back over to the Wix app people so that um, you can close us out if, um, if folks are not feeling questioning. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, that was amazing. That was, Sweet. I really loved it. And I can see from the engagement that I really loved it as well. Uh, just a few quick notes. We will be, this was recorded. So we will be putting this um, on our website that will be available. Uh, so if you wanna come back and see it or refer anybody to it, anything like that, we will have that option. Um, and Michael did say that there were some things that he was forwarding as well. So we'll make sure to get those to you. Um, please remember there is a second part to this next Tuesday and uh, we'd really love to see you all here. And we will also be sending an evalu evaluation form. Please do fill it out. Um, I know that there's a lot of like pandemic fatigue and screen fatigue. fatigue. Um, for those asking about next week's session, when you registered for this session, it automatically registered you for both. So you just have to come back to the same link and it's next Tuesday from two to four o'clock. Yeah, Before we leave, 
I just want to thank everybody for for being here today, and I really enjoyed um, the interaction and all the good stuff that came out of the chat. Um, and thank you for Wix app to like invite Forge to come back. We've done several things in the past, and it's really um, always a pleasure to to be with you all and and spend some time. And thank you for Shelley to um, come in late and and read quotes and do um, do mindless work. Um, but I really, really, really appreciate it. And thanks to the ASL and captioning people too. Thanks a lot. All right, perfect. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.